Hi, everybody. Welcome back to 10% True. I'm really pleased to be bringing you my interview with Hacker Haskin. He's an F-15E MC-12 T-38 pilot who also worked as a U-2 mission planner. And he came down a couple of weeks ago. We recorded over the course of a weekend, uh, three or four hours of material. There's four videos in this series. Um, we covered a range of different topics, everything from undergraduate pilot training, introduction to fighter fundamentals, uh, some of his first operational flying as a Strike Eagle pilot, uh, a tiny bit of uh, discussion around his combat experience, and some other general topics related to being a fighter pilot going through the pipeline and, uh, and reaching an operational squadron. We didn't get an opportunity to talk about some of the other things that we wanted to. So he has three combat tours, uh, two in the Strike Eagle, one in the MC-12. We didn't really get to talk about those in detail. His time on the MC-12 and as a U-2 mission planner, we also didn't get a chance to talk about. Um, so what's going to happen, he's going to come back in, in January or February. We'll record another round of interviews and we'll cover that. One of the things that we did this time around was we talked a bit about uh, DCS, the, the flight simulation. Uh, we have an option when he comes back of um, doing a, a full-on DCS session. Um, one of the things that he did as a job was he was an introduction to fighter fundamentals, an IFF instructor pilot, which meant that he took um, guys and girls that were coming out of the UPT pipeline and got them ready to go to their B course, their, their basic training course for the fighters that they had been assigned to. And what we could do is run a sort of pseudo IFF training session with him when he comes back. So if that's something that is of interest to you, let me know. I started the interview with Hacker by asking him to tell me about his CV. Enjoy. Well, let's see. I uh, Yeah, you're right. I, I started out um, in the Air Force. I actually come from a, a family that is an aviation-oriented family. So uh, it was always sort of in my blood and, and in my interest to... to join the military and to fly. And um, so I went to college up at the University of Washington up in Seattle, and I was an ROTC graduate. And um, the time period that I was going through college was in the post-Cold War, post-Desert Storm um, drawdown, I guess, of the Air Force. And I, the numbers are a little bit shady. I'm sure Google will, will tell you what the numbers really are. But I think it's a time that the size of the force went from about I don't know, just under a million people down to about 300,000 people. So there was a substantial drawdown of airplane people, bases, et cetera. So the result of that was, well, when it was time for me to graduate and, and move on to a, a job in the military, I didn't get picked to go to pilot training. And that's what you had always wanted to do. It is, right, yeah. So I, I wanted to fly, and uh, uh, but it was mostly my own fault. Uh, you know, I majored in uh, skirts and beer instead of actually <laughs> academia. <laughs> so uh, so consequently, I, I went into the Air Force as a maintenance officer, um, and I was uh, stationed down in Ellis Air Force Base, and I uh, was a munitions maintenance officer, which initially I was upset about. I really wanted to go fly, but um, it turned out to be a very good learning experience, Um leadership experience too because you know right away I went on active duty as a you know 22 year old 23 year old lieutenant and I was in charge of in charge of you know maybe like 50 to 100 people right away so uh, I, I learned a lot from uh, the senior enlisted leaders kind of about how to be a military leader and um, really really had a great experience in retrospect but so the result or the, the I guess the path forward was I wanted to go fly there was a methodology for officers who were on active duty to get selected, go to pilot training. It was a competitive process. And uh, I mean, by competitive, I mean the very first year that I applied to go to pilot training, there were 400 to 500 applicants of officers who were already on active duty who wanted to become pilots, and they picked 10. Uh, the second year that I did it, or applied, they picked 50. And the third year that I applied, I think they picked 150, something like that, and I got picked in there. So that, that tells you the quality of officer that I was. <laughs> no, I, I actually had a good time. I had very good recommendations from my leadership to go. They were very supportive of the fact that I wanted to leave the maintenance world and, and go be a pilot. So, um, that, that, yeah. I mean, that's, that's kind of symptomatic of a, a lot that happens in aviation, though, isn't it? There's, there's a degree of luck involved. You, you hear, you, you'll talk about UPT uh, later, but you hear about classes of UPT where nobody gets a fighter you know everybody everybody goes to the bomber stream or the transport stream absolutely so um, and, and that obviously almost everything in a military career really has to do with luck and timing I mean obviously there's an, an amount of talent and there's um, you know having 
supportive leadership or peers or whatever. But uh, yeah, timing has quite a bit to do with with where someone ends up. So I did get picked for to go to UPT. Uh, that was in uh, 1997. I actually went in 1998 to uh, Columbus Air Force Base down in wonderful Mississippi and um, spent a yeah, about, well, first I, I went there uh, as a casual student. So in other words, I, I moved to Mississippi. I showed up on base. It wasn't time for my class to start yet. So I was doing odd jobs around the base. Spent a year, 53 weeks in pilot training uh, at the time, flying the T-37 and the T-38. And uh, at the end of that, I got um, my first choice. I got picked to go fly the F-15E. Uh, following that, I stayed at Columbus for a short six-week program called Introduction to Fighter Fundamentals. Moved off to Goldsboro, North Carolina for the uh, B course, the initial training course for the F-15E. And then that was about seven months long or so. Stayed on there for my first assignment at uh, Seymour, flying in the 336 Fighter Squadron. Had quite a lot of adventures there, which I'm sure we'll get into plenty. Um, spent just over three years in that squadron. From the follow, my follow-on to that was I went to Moody Air Force Base as a instructor in that Introduction to Fighter Fundamental Squadron. So, um, flying the AT-38. At that point, we had actually switched from T-38As and Bs, which I had gone through training as a student with, and I was an instructor in T-38Cs. Following three years in that, which again was an assignment I really enjoyed, uh, I went back to the Strike Eagle right over here to uh, the UK at RAF Lakenheath and uh, had some more wonderful adventures uh, deployed in combat there. Following the uh, my Strike Eagle tour, um, I got I, I, I moved into sort of a, a portion of my career. I was on the back half of my career. I was already a, a, an 04, a major at the time. And so uh, I kind of moved into a portion where your assignments are... are more closely controlled by leadership because they're trying to figure out whether you're going to be a commander or whether you're going to have, you know, some of these other leadership career tracks. So I got hired to be uh, a commander, which never manifested itself out in actuality, but uh, I got hired to be a commander in the training command. So I went to Vance Air Force Base, which was back to UPT as a T-38 instructor. From there, uh, I went to a what was supposed to be a temporary duty assignment in Afghanistan flying a surveillance airplane called the MC-12. And then I finished off uh, after about a year of that um, in a non-flying position out at Beale Air Force Base as a mission planner for the U-2. So you ended your career with, with how many hours? I want to say I had about 3,500 hours of military time. The breakdown of that roughly is it's about 1,500 hours of uh, time in the Eagle, about 1,000 hours of T-38 time, and just under uh, 1,000 hours of uh, MC-12 time. You go back to to UPT then. Did the expectations match, or did the experience match the expectations? Did you know, how did how did it work? Uh, it's a good question because you know I I know this is going to sound very strange, but you know I, I I did that in the pre-internet age, or you know when there wasn't quite as much information out there, and um, I, I remember actually going around to as many bookstores. You know, it was pre-Amazon days and things like that trying to find books that talked about the UPT experience. And being in a maintenance squadron, I wasn't around a whole lot of, uh, of pilots. The few pilots that I did interact with, I'd ask them and they'd say really, I don't know, just sort of ridiculously general statements like, oh man, that was the best year of my life. It's a great time. You're going to love that. Uh, or they would say, oh man, that's hard. You better really get on your game. So none of that I thought was, was particularly useful. So um, I was able to find, you know, maybe four or five books that were by pilots that were either talking about their experiences or it was a fictionalized account or something like that. Um, and ultimately, quite honestly, none of it was very helpful. None of it really gave me the, the true picture of kind of what the experience was going to be like. What I did expect it to be, and, and it met my expectations, was, was challenging. And I already had about, I don't know, two or 300 hours of civilian flying time in my logbook, I mean, not counting all the time I, you know, spent as a kid flying around with my, my family. But, you know, I was a reasonably experienced general aviation pilot when I went. And, man, I, I found UPT to be very challenging. And not just f from a, I guess, a, a stick and rudder perspective or even an academic perspective, but it's kind of all of the training methodology rolled into one that was difficult. Um, and, you know, obviously the 
there's there's a saying out there, you know, that nobody in in human history has had more experience than Uncle Sam, you know, training people to fly airplanes. So they have a good idea of what what's required, but the the formal training process and the methodology was just different than anything I'd ever experienced before. So it, it was hard. I had to be really on a, you know, it's it's funny. Earlier, I I kind of joked about. Uh, I had very average academic performance in college. Um, you know, I was sort of a, a 3.0 to 3.3 student out of four, you know, so definitely not a, a superior student by any stretch of the imagination. And most of that had to do really with, you know, my attitude toward studying and all things like that. Um, but when I got to UPT, I really had to, no kidding. This was something that I was obviously very interested in. It was a goal, so I had to uh, put a lot of attention toward uh, toward doing well. Mm. So, so one of the things that you hear on, um, if you go to the forums, you know, you hear guys saying, "Well, should I should I do some?" We know the forums are always full of truthful data, and there's, well, there's some good stuff there. Of course, I there mean, is. You know, some people. You know, some people can be a bit harsh. Some people talk without really the benefit. You're, you're of talking experience. to someone who's been like so. a aviation forum rat for you know 20 years here. So yeah. So, so what would your advice be then? I mean, is it worth if somebody says, should I go out and do some some GA flying before I go to UPT, or should I get the books, try and get hold of a Dash One, you know, do some study? You know, what is the advice? Just turn up and, and do it. Do some prep. What do you want to? Uh, you know, it's interesting. This is something that comes up quite a lot. I saw it even when I was a T-38 instructor, uh, at, while I was an IFF instructor as well. Um, you, in, in UPT, you frequently get guys that have uh, a lot of civilian flying time. Even in my UPT class, uh, there were a couple of guys who had um, substantial amounts of time. I mean, there was a guy who had, was an airline pilot, you know, before he came in. And um, so guys that had a lot of experience, even experience flying aerobatics and things like that. And, um, again, it's, it's not necessarily the stick and rudder flying that's different, but it's really everything. You're flying off a different set of regulations and you're using, um, you know, very Air Force specific techniques to fly, fly instruments, fly formation, things like that. So there's a lot that you really can't learn in the civilian world. And so even if you show up with a substantial amount of experience, um, there's a, there's an equalization point you know, where somebody who shows up who doesn't have any experience is, is going to meet you in terms of, of their capability as well. So that doesn't exactly answer your question. Obviously, somebody who uh, is wanting to get to UPT or prepare for UPT, you know, the best things you can do is f do instrument flying, get instrument flying experience, and then get some level of aerobatic experience. You know, not, not that you have to go out and be an IAC performer, but at least be upside down in an airplane and realize that, uh, you know, you... The airplane's not going to come apart, and you're not going to die, and hopefully you're not going to throw up. <laughs> well, I was going to, so I was going to ask you about that. That's the other common fear, isn't it? People, people are worried about getting airsick because maybe somebody rode in an airplane once and it was bumpy and they felt sick. And lots of lots of pilots get airsick. I will say for me that in my entire flying career, I've actually never been, you know, what the military terms airsick. I've never actually, you know, chunked. Um, I have felt a little bit ill, you know, when somebody was flying and we were doing BFM or something like that. But I've been very fortunate, but. The more important part to your point is lots of students get airsick, lots of pilots get airsick, um, and there is a, a pretty good methodology from a, um, a physiology perspective. And the Air, uh, the Air Force has great aerospace physiology folks. They are not looking to you know to take a student who gets sick and try and boot them out the door. They're really trying to to fix that person you know from a medical perspective. So yeah, for anybody who's interested in doing that and is and is worried about air sickness. Yeah, it's it's an issue, you know, because you're not they're not going to allow you to graduate if you continue to have active air sickness. But uh, the Air Force is interested in fixing that. Yeah, I, I talked to a good friend of yours. Um, I won't name him, but but he, you know, Wizzo, a, a striking mm -hmm. Wizzo. Is he uh, a short guy? Short guy. Yeah, yeah in the rockets, uh -huh. touched himself a lot apparently. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I talked to him a little bit about that, and and he was saying. You know, he's he's battled with air sickness through his entire career, and I guess the to me it sounds like the the crucial factor is that you don't actually vomit. So if you feel sick, mm -hmm. you know that's manageable. But if you're vomiting all the time, that's an issue. And and he was saying to me, even going down the chute in a, over Iraq, you know, being shot at, um, you know, he would still, despite all the distractions, he would still end up feeling feeling air sick. So, um, and my my personal experience of it, you know, having been fortunate enough to ride in the back 
of some fast jets uh, on a number of occasions is that if you start thinking about it, it will manifest itself. If, yeah, it's if, probably true. If, yeah. if you're not thinking about it and you're distracted and you're doing something else, then, then it won't. So. Well, you know, one of the techniques as, a, as an instructor that we have, that if you're flying with someone who starts feeling airsick, especially if they're not flying, you know, if you're, especially if you're giving someone a ride or something like that, is to give them the controls. And that way, suddenly they become mentally occupied with a task and they're not thinking about being sick. So that, that does work. So, so other than that, what are the other big challenges that people have in at, at UPT? Formation flying, instrument flying. Why are people washing out? What, what, what typically do you see? Well, I, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different things that, that you know, can be problems for people. You know, some people just don't have good hands. I, and I've, to be honest with you, I've flown with students and I've met people that have all of these problems. And I, I don't really want to say problems, but, you know, they, they, they're not able to, to meet the standards as far as the Air Force is concerned. But, you know, there's some people that are very smart academically and they're, you know, they're mentally are, are quick and, and are fine, but they just don't have the hands. You know, they just can't make the airplane do what what we want them to do with it. There's other people that have amazingly good hands and are just natural born flyers and don't have the the mental capacity, the cognitive capacity to keep up with the speed at which things are happening. You know, there's basically, I mean, every every facet of human performance that you can think of, um, the military flying training process is going to test. You know, I mean, it's a there's a physical fitness issue there. There's cognitive abilities. There's, you know, ability to emotionally compartmentalize. There's all kinds of things that are going to be uh, tested uh, as a student and by the process. And, um, you know, if you don't have the capacity to, to overcome those things, you're not going to make it through. And when you think about the bigger picture, I mean, what is UPT trying to produce? They're trying to, you know, screen out people who aren't going to be able to adapt to combat flying. You know, regardless of what airframe you go to, the whole purpose of a military pilot is to fly in combat operations. So um, many of the the stresses that are imparted by the process and, and the way that the process, the whole structure of it is designed, is designed to, to pick out and weed out the people who are going to be best, um, I guess, pick out the people that are best suited and weed out the people who are not best suited for a destination in a combat aircraft. And that's an important distinction, isn't it? You, you you mentioned you know the ultimate objective is to get somebody who can go and fly in combat, but UPT is is purely administrative in that sense. Isn't it, it is. There's, no yeah, there's nothing mission oriented whatsoever in there. You also mentioned speed. You mentioned keeping up with the aircraft. The one thing I hear again, time and again, about the T thirty eight is that it's fast in the landing pattern. You know, there's some critical speeds there. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges of going from something like a T six to a T thirty eight? I really love the T-38 to start with, so if I start showing, you know, a little bit of adulation about what a great airplane it is, it's, uh, it's because I'm biased. Um, but obviously, the T-38 is an old airplane, and as we currently sit here and speak, uh, it is really showing its age with respect to its ability to teach current generation pilots who are going to go on to fifth generation fighters and beyond. Um, so take it all in that context. Um, obviously it was designed in the fifties. It was designed to be a trainer for century series fighters. It was designed to go fast in a straight line. Uh, and that imparts some natural limitations on what it can do. Um, but like all of the good aviation trainers or advanced aviation trainers, it is a hard airplane to fly well. Uh, and it has, be, you know, because of the very small wing, because of the thrust limitations and et cetera. Um, if you are not treating it well, it won't treat you well back. Uh, so again, it's, it's a hard airplane to fly well. Some of the things you've already mentioned, you know, it's fast. Um, students are going from an airplane that is a 200 or 250 knot airplane uh, immediately to a 300 to 350 knot airplane, you know, and a, um, a 50 to 75 percent increase in speed uh, is, is, a, is a huge leap, you know, for somebody who only has 100 hours of flying. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that, that uh, civilian pilots often have an advantage initially in UPT, and it's usually during the T-6, uh, or in my time, the T-37 program, that that manifests itself. And, you know, they may not be able to, to do quite as well in the formation flying parts, but the instrument flying parts, certainly, and the cross-country flying and stuff, they generally do better than their classmates who, um, who don't have time. What I saw as a T-38 instructor was uh, the T-38 was the great equalizer. You know, that most people, most civilian pilots 
uh, did not have any experience of anything that was that fast that required that level of attention and concentration. And um, so even the ones who had done extremely well in the T6 program, uh, many of them I saw struggle in the T38 program. So uh, in that sense, again, bearing in mind what it was designed to do, it's a very good trainer. Um, it's not necessarily the traits that you would want in a in a, a basic trainer, right? So something filling the T6 role in a T38 would be terrible for. Um, but that being said, uh, what it did for sort of my generation of pilots 20 years ago, and obviously the everybody in between the 1950s and then, was it very accurately mimicked the performance characteristics of the frontline fighters of the day, up to and including the Strike Eagle that I went to. So, you know, everything from sort of the F-100 all the way up through the fourth-gen fighters. So, you know, I think if you look at it in that perspective, it's an amazingly capable and, and very successful trainer for its role. Can, can, you give a, can you give a specific example of where it can bite? You, you talked about if you, if you maltreat it, it will maltreat you. Well, I mean, the, the number one sort of famous place that the T-38 has had and continues to have problems is in the landing phase, or the, I should say the, the kind of the pattern to land the circuit, if you will, in the UK parlance. Um, very early on, uh, in the airplane's development, there were a lot of uh, final turn problems. Uh, and the reason for that is obviously the very small wing um, and the way that the wing stalls means that you can develop unrecoverable sink rates that don't also involve big um, pitch changes. You know, So normal aircraft, when you get into a stall, you're going to have a dramatic movement of the nose down as the wing stalls. Uh, and the T-38 can stall that way. It does have a little bit of pitch moment, but it also has some modes of stall or some uh, areas that it can stall where you're just going to simply get a, a huge sink rate that isn't immediately noticeable. And by the time it is noticeable, it's, it's far too late. Um, so that's one area when you go back and look at the history of T-38 accidents, um, especially, you know, sort of in its first 10 or 15 years, that's where most of them were. Um, they kind of put a Band-Aid on that by adding an AOA indexer onto it, which you and I were talking a little bit about the other day. But um, before that, it didn't even have an AOA vein or, an, or any indication in the cockpit of that. So I think that's, that's really the biggest one. I mean, there's some other, I'll say, maneuvering issues. Obviously, it's a very fast airplane. It's, uh, if you get it going fast, it's tough to get it to slow down. So on things like formation flying, join-ups, rejoins, uh, that's one area where you really have to do a lot of energy management. Uh, again, because of the small wing, when you're doing aerobatics, especially vertical over the top aerobatics, it needs a huge amount of space. You know, the kind of rule of thumb is that it needs 10,000 feet to be able to do a, a loop. Um, and it doesn't exactly need 10,000 feet. You know, something big, um, depending on what your speed and G is. And so when you are a student doing aerobatics and part of your training is there's there's a whole set of of uh, acro maneuvers that you have to do and so it requires a lot of planning on the student's part just in terms of three-dimensional understanding of where you are in the airspace and and what your energy state is to be able to make that work so you know i've had a lot of students do uh we, we talk we joke about things like the barrel dive you know instead of a barrel roll it turns into a, a dive because they don't manage their energy uh, you know, a split J instead of a split S, you know, so they end up uh, getting the nose downhill and they, and they don't have quite the vertical area to be able to pull out of that. So um, that's bitten many a student before. Uh, and again, just because it's a, it's a fast aircraft, uh, large turn radii and things like that, um, when you're just physically managing, you know, we were just talking about the vertical uh, situational awareness, when you're talking about your lateral confines of a, of a practice area awareness you know many students have just you know blasted out the side of a moa and uh, you know not known it or or anyway so those are the kind of things so it's fast it's very maneuverable but it has some some maneuverability limitations and then uh, as far as the the stall corner of the aircraft perform performance envelope it can really bite you so you, you were talking about uh, you know it's a clean jet the t-38 fast difficult to slow down um you went through uh, and, and played a little bit of dcs yesterday did some formation, I did. formation it was, flying it was a bit of a humbling experience it was, it was, it was some mixed performance there um <laughs> mostly mostly on the downside of the mix we, we can play some of that while uh while you're talking about i think this. they'll find that fairly entertaining
I am really a shitty pilot. <laughs> I was expecting more, I'm going to be yeah, honest. This is embarrassing. This also will not be on the internet. Because <laughs> all the guys I used to fly with would be like, yeah. Because <laughs> oh. <suck." laughs> they now you're in trouble. This is, this He's in a turn. This is, this is par for the course for this dick. <laughs> he was all over the place. This is really embarrassing. How do you go about teaching somebody to fly formation in the, in the T-38? Kind of in, in all of its different capacities, whether it's close formation or tactical formation, is that it embodies, uh, or I guess it requires, a lot of the same components of uh, 3D maneuvering and, and understanding of uh, energy states that actual dogfighting and other air-to-air -air maneuvering does. So it happens to be a pretty good learning laboratory um, for teaching those concepts to a student, and, you know, it's. But the problem is, is that those advanced concepts, understanding line of sight rates between, you know, relative motion between aircraft and and the feel of the jet and things like that, those require a little bit of experience. Um, so, be, because students don't really have a whole lot of experience, they have learned formation flying in the T six. They do understand some of the basic concepts. But they don't necessarily how to do it, know how to do it in a in a much faster airplane, a much more maneuver airplane. So, um, you start with some some training wheels, you know, some some basic uh, things that a, a student can kind of hang their hat on until they really are able to apply those concepts that they already know. So, uh, in the T thirty eight, you know, we just start out with the the fingertip formation position, the close formation position, um, and so it's all positionally based, looking at the lead aircraft from the student's line of sight. So the, the first thing we, we teach them is to have yourself positioned so that your eye line is looking directly up the leading edge of the wing. And that establishes about a 45-degree aft line that they're on. For the f um, four aft on that line, or, or how far in or out, I guess, on that, that angled line, they want to be looking aft at the, uh, the rotation point of the horizontal stabilizer, the slab bolt, what we call that. And then for the up and down, then you want them looking directly up the wing. So looking at the wingtip with a, with a skinny wing, they don't see much at the top or much at the bottom. So you're simply giving them a couple of things to pay attention to to begin with, to establish the appropriate formation position. And then once you're in that, as an instructor, I am giving them control of the aircraft for usually for very small periods of time while they figure out how to apply the fine motor skills of making constant small corrections that are to the controls, both to the stick and to the, the throttle and to the, the rudders a little bit, to maintain a good position. So usually, initially on, they're grossly all over the place, and, and they're using sort of the, the big, you know, gross motor movements, you know, moving the stick from their shoulder instead of from their wrist and such. Uh, interestingly enough, it generally doesn't take that long for students to become somewhat comfortable with the smaller movements required out of the, the T-38 and then start applying some of the things that they've already learned previously in the T-6. For the most part, on, on the first flight, you know, at the beginning, obviously, there's several transfers of controls, but, you know, by the time you get to the end of the flight, the student is doing the vast majority of the flying. And um, even though there are some maneuvers that you're, you're going to put them in, um, they're generally able to... Uh, to make good corrections and you know only maybe when you're in a you know a big steep bank or something like that and they get themselves kind of an uncomfortable position you'll take the airplane from but anyway the, the point is students are adapting relatively quickly to the the formation basics that they've already learned in the t6 more importantly for the t38 program is moving into the advanced formation techniques mostly the, the tactical flying so instead of being three feet away from another aircraft you're moving it out to, you know, three quarters of a mile to a mile away from the other aircraft, which is sort of the formation cornerstone of what fighter flying is going to be about. And that, that applies whether you're going to something like an A-10 and, you know, primarily doing a ground attack type thing, or whether you're going on to the, you know, fourth or fifth gen air-to-air -air fighters. That situation, that type of formation flying, that is an area where it requires more understanding of those relative motion, line of sight rates, angles, feel of the jet to assess your energy state, 
looking at the other aircraft and just being able to visually assess what the other aircraft's energy state is. Again, it's closer in terms of assessments and skills that they're going to be able to need to fly good air-to-air combat. Initially, in the T-6, they've done a small amount of that maneuvering to begin with, but it's, it's, it's situations that are set up very simply. There's not a whole lot of variation in terms of what their flight lead is doing or you know, if you look at this in like a, an offender defender, you know, type situation, their target aircraft is doing very predictable maneuvering. Um, so the, the problems are easier for them to solve and easier to learn. And then the objective is getting closer to the end of UPT, the, the you know, before, right before they graduate and move on to, to IFF. Uh, I want that other aircraft that they're maneuvering in relation to, to not be predictable, you know, to have some, I, I, I used to call it bad flight lead, you know, and, and I would tell my, when I was a flight lead in UPT and I was telling student wingmen, I would tell them, I'm not going to make my turns exactly 90 degrees or 180 degrees. I'm not going to be flying exactly on, we call it the contract. That's a certain amount of airspeed, a certain rate of turn, if you will. Because contract flying is a, it's a crutch. You know, it's something I want to be an easy platform for my student to to learn from, especially early on in the program. I don't want to create more problems for them than they already have. But as their skill level comes up, I do want to start creating little problems to to kind of refine their capability to assess where I actually am. So, you know, I don't want them looking at their their compass to see what heading is 90 degrees from where they are and then just roll out on the heading. I want them maybe to use that as a, you know, initial target, but then I want them to be looking out the window at me so that they can maneuver in relation to me as a flight lead. And again, those more advanced concepts will be certainly tested when they get into the IFF program and even the, the beginning stages of their B courses and their fighters. And then certainly those concepts will be core to when they actually start air-to-air maneuvering against a hostile, a hostile wingman, <laughs> a bandit. So, so, so tell us a little bit about IFF then. What is it? Um, how long does it last? What, what's the purpose of it? So conceptually, it's Introduction to Fighter Fundamentals. It's a, it's a basic course to fill in all of the um, core skills that are not taught in UPT but need to be understood for the individual fighter B courses to, to really just teach transition training. In other words... The, uh, you know, the C-38 is a, a relatively inexpensive aircraft to fly. Students are already experienced in it, so it's easier to teach these core fundamentals in an airplane they already understand than it would be to put them in an A-10, F-16, F-15, which is substantially more complicated and more expensive to fly. So um, after students are UPT graduates, the length of the program is about six to eight weeks. You know, really, it's depending on a lot of stuff. Um, somewhere in the order of 15 to 20 flights. Um, and it's generally broken down. Uh, there, there are different tracks depending on what aircraft you're going to go to. There's an air-to-ground focus track, an air-to-air focus track, and then a multi-roll track. That may have changed. You know, last time I was doing that was you know, eight or nine years ago. But, um, you know, so if you're an A-10 guy you're, or if you're a student who's bound to go to the A-10, you're going to do the air-to-ground focus track. And if you're going to an F-16 or, or F-15E, you're going to do the multi-role. And if you're an F-15C guy or a Raptor guy, you're going to go to the air-to-air piece. Nonetheless, there's the, the core types of things that are being taught. It's all advanced tactical formation, offensive BFM, defensive BFM, if you're an air-to-air or multi-role guy, you're going to do high-aspect BFM. And then if you're a air-to-ground or multi-role guy, you're going to do both conventional bomb dropping and strafing and then uh, tactical pattern, air-to-surface-to-air employment or air-to-surface employment. Um, the other half that really kind of gets often overlooked is IFF is not just teaching students to be wingmen in the air. It's also teaching them the the behavioral aspects of being a wingman on the ground. Um, outside of the, the, even the fighter community, but outside of the military, I think people don't realize that there's a, uh, a very strong cultural component to being a fighter pilot, to being in a fighter squadron, to kind of not just um, what you do you know, while you're in the airplane, but what you're also doing while you're in the squadron. 
uh, whether it's socially or whether it's your work. And so, you know, we term that wingman 101. Being a wingman doesn't just mean that you're number two in a formation. It's a, it's a role that you are going to play, um, you know, around the squadron. It's a role that you're going to be playing um, as a member of a flight, whether you're inside the cockpit or not. So there's a, a lot of uh, instruction that has to take place to get students in that mindset. Because, you know, that they, they try in UPT to establish that. But the, the training program is not really structured well enough or, I mean, it's really not intended to, to teach that mindset. Okay, so it doesn't do a particularly good job at it. And so I, I know I, I don't mean to kind of be nebulous about that, but I'll give you an example. So, you know, one of the first things that we tell wingmen are their responsibility is to be in position. Okay, and so when you're talking about flying, that means I need you to physically have your airplane in the formation position that I put you in. Um, and there's obviously lots of reasons for that, whether it's safety or effectiveness or whatever. But the com other component of that is you need to be in position on the ground. So uh, something as simple as when our brief starts, you know, our briefing has a time that it starts, that the door to the briefing room closes. And my expectation is that the student's in position physically. He's has his flight gear prepared, and he has all of the administrative things that he needs to have signed off or completed prior to the flight are done. Um, he comes into the room with all of the materials that he needs. Um, there are expectations about how the room is set up prior to the flight that he's accomplished those things. So, you know, I as a flight leader and instructor, I walk in, three, two, one, hack, and that door closes, and he's ready, he or she is in ready and in position. Um, those are concepts that are introduced at UPT, but again, because of the limitations of the structure of the, the UPT environment, they're not really harped on to the same level and same fineness of point that they are at UPT. And there's, there's, a, I mean, we could, we could spend an entirely different podcast talking about all of the multitude of ways that, that students need to learn this wingmanship, but you know, it's just an example. Yeah. I think, I mean, if, if there's appetite from the audience if people want it we could come back and record something like that wouldn't so. they be sick of me talking for hours I would about be. that yeah I, would. I mean you, you can record it on your own maybe i maybe i should yeah i'll start my own podcast it would be a monologue um i'm gonna call it i'm gonna call it 11 percent true <laughs> this is basically a monologue i, I, ask, <laughs> I ask a five second question you give me a 10 minute answer oh uh, it's good it's good so uh, so so can i can i take you back i mean we're, we're not going to make this a dcs um, podcast we we can come back and will that be uh, more popular I think it would okay yeah. anything where you talk less uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe see, they, I can just show my actions see, on there you, and they you've, be... you've got me now not taking my own podcast seriously <laughs> um, so, so what I'm thinking is, is we, we, we can come back and do a DCS um, I'd love to a DCS podcast I really enjoyed you, it you talk about that and you you know you said some really nice things about it you, you had you, you grew up on flight sims and I did. And so you were yeah, I mean, I, I, I started back in sort of the late eighties in the, the DOS era with, you know, flight sim three, I think, or, you know, whatever it was. And all the way up through all the different generations of Microsoft flight sim and Falcon four, I think, uh, Falcon 4.0, you know, was the first real big fighter flight sim. Did you play that? Did you play Falcon four and, um, Jane's F 15 E and things like that. And quite honestly, it, you know, I, probably for the last 20 years, I haven't really spent any substantial amount of time doing PC-based flight simming because it just hasn't really, you know, been, I, I, there's, I have a lot of different interests and obviously limited time. So I hadn't really seen any of these things. But for the last year or so, I've kind of heard these rumblings about DCS and there's people that I fly with at the airlines who are saying, oh man, you gotta, you gotta check out DCS. And uh, I have seen Mover uh, play it, you know, so I, I, I kind of had some idea as to what it was about, but I had no personal exposure to it until yesterday. And so uh, I was really impressed and surprised at the fidelity, not just in terms of what it visually looks like, but, um, you know, also the, the level of detail and the, gosh, I'm, I'm sure you can have a completely immersive experience if you have, you know, one of these cockpits set up and you're using virtual reality and all, all that kind of stuff, it seems like it has a fidelity level that it, it either is going to be a, a useful tool. Yeah, I think you could use it as some sort of a training tool or uh, it would certainly be a lot more fun, you know, to play if you're just doing it as a as a as a kick. So, so, so one of the things that I was thinking when, you know, when you were talking about the tactical formation keeping 
um, you know, the distance is expanding between aircraft. You saying, you know, I'm a mile away, but you need to look. You know, I don't want you to look at the compass and see I'm 180 degrees out before That's we right. start our turn. I want you to look at me and look at the line of sight changes. You know, one of the things that DCS struggles with, and it's just, I, I mean, it's not it's not a problem that, that is exclusive to DCS. It's a challenge, I guess, that from a visual point of view, sticking something on a monitor like you yeah. played here, uh, and on a virtual reality headset in terms of pixel density and and that kind of thing, is is really sort of modeling distant aircraft. Um, uh, you know, I was curious to know. As a fighter pilot, you know, strike eagle guy, um, IFF instructor, what sort of distances are you? Were you able to visually, you know, pick up other aircraft? I mean, I mean, so when it, we say fighter size, it, that's a huge variation. Big, it is big right. Big eagle, eagle or a small. Well, it's on know, the fish, big, fish big fatty or formation or a, a family model size airplane. Exactly. Though. So, but what sort of distances, uh, you know, are you able to, to to see things? And and in that sort of you know swirling tactical environment where you no longer now have a, an obvious cue to look you know down your three nine line for your wingman because you're in a, mm -hmm. a line of breast formation you know how how do you find other aircraft how do you pick things up again visual cues are extremely important to both you know cooperative formation flying and you know any kind of air combat uh, one of the things that i was talking about yesterday and we alluded to this earlier was when i'm in for instance tactical formation in a t-38 or an eagle you know, one of the things that we talk about, we, we use all, all visual cues on the other aircraft. I shouldn't say all, but a lot of visual cues on the other aircraft to determine what my distance is. You know, um, can I read the the markings on the tail? You know, can I read the tail code or the or the serial number? Um, can I make out that it's camouflage or does the airplane just look sort of generally hazy gray? Can I make out the canopy and the cockpit as a separate portion of the aircraft or does it all sort of blend in? Um that's kind of what I was talking about yesterday when we were on DCS that I couldn't, based on the monitor size and things like that, I really couldn't make out those things. And that's even something that at least the last time I was involved in um, simulation flying in the, in the, both the Eagle and the T-38 was the simulation technology and the WIS, the weapon system trainers had not quite developed to the point where that was, I could accurately use those cues to determine distance. Um, I don't. I have to assume that in the last, you know, eight to ten years, that 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 has come along since the Air Force has put a lot of effort and time into uh, into that technology. But I know I didn't directly answer your question there. Um, my personal sort of max distance, I guess, that I've uh, I could regularly, not just you know, on any one given day, um, see was somewhere around the fifteen mile um, perspective. And that was even aided. So in other words, that was looking through the HUD with a, a green target designation container with a radar lock. Um, so not only did I know physically in the HUD where to be looking, but I knew sort of what distance that was at. And, um, you know, with the giant uh, wings of Rodan and the uh, Eagle, you know, when they would show me a belly or a wing flash or something like that, I, I, could, I could see them and, and maintain the tally as a bandit um, that distance out. Is that... You know, realistic for other aircraft. Uh, I don't. I don't know that I could do that with a Viper. It's a much smaller aircraft. I don't know that if I could do that with something like a MiG twenty one, uh, or maybe even a MiG twenty nine. Um, but you know, I, I could do that with an Eagle. You, you, if it's a MiG twenty nine, you'd see the the smoke from the engines. So, so <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, although um, I have a little bit of experience flying against a, a, an East German MiG twenty nine and. Um, Without getting into too many of the details there, I um, I thought he was an eagle for quite a while. I was very surprised. I didn't. It was during an exercise, and I didn't know that it was a MiG twenty nine. And so, uh, it was very very late uh, in the engagement that I realized it was not a friendly. Enough said about that. Okay, let's move on. Going blind. Then let's just talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> can we work in the little Dos Gringos, the Two's Blind song? Can we play that? Yeah, one? we can play yeah, that now. Good, yeah. Yeah. Well, we have to get permission. Cue the song. No. I taxi down over 12 Chevrolet feet. I lost count of who's one and who's three. It's nothing new, it happens every time. 
over Victor Two's blind We took off on a radar assistant. So talk about going blind then. So so that is the act of losing sight of your wingman or your flight lead. Uh yes, and let's put it into a little bit of context. Um and again, bearing in mind that with fifth generation and beyond fighters, this has changed. And, um, you know, I obviously don't have much personal experience with that. But in the fourth generation and earlier concept of, of how we flew as a, a formation, as a basic sort of tactical building block, visual mutual support was the bedrock of that. So in other words, as, as a wingman, my number one job was to keep lead in sight, period, dot. And whatever I needed to do to keep lead in sight was, was my job. And so going blind, i.e. losing sight, was uh, my number one sin. Not my personal number one sin, but, you know, Wingman's, Wingman's biggest mistake. Again, the rationale for that is if you don't see your flight lead, you can't be supporting him, i.e. making sure that there's no other aircraft that are sneaking up on, on both of us or him. Um, and ostensibly, if I'm in a position where I can see my flight lead, he can also see me. And so, again, it's a, a uh, mutual support type of situation. And obviously, they're over time. Well, go ahead. So I, I just, I mean, I just don't know how you do it. How do you do it? You know, you're you're turning, you're pulling G, you're to some degree or another disoriented. Um, your focus is on the bad guy or not being shot or whatever it is that you're doing at that time. You know, when I when I learned to fly GA, you know, they taught us a visual scan. Scan. You know, you pick a quadrant, you look for a little while, you te- detect if there's any movement. That's still the basic quadrant, component. You know, you know, so it's the same thing. It is. Okay, but you're doing 420 knots, 480 knots, whatever it is. So I already sort of mentioned, uh, you know, one of those components, uh, one of those core skills of uh, formation flying and dogfighting is being able to judge relative motion and judge energy states based on feel. That means I'm not looking inside the cockpit for digital cues to tell me exactly what my speed is or exactly what altitude I'm at, you know, heading, et cetera, all of those things. If I'm able to build up enough experience, just the visceral sort of seat of the pants experience in knowing how to execute a particular G turn or an energy sustaining turn or something like that, I don't have to look inside the cockpit. Instead, I can dedicate a lot more of my time looking outside the cockpit so that includes keeping my, my flight lead slash my wingman in sight and scanning out there for other aircraft. Um, and oh, by the way, I have different audio cues inside the aircraft to know, you know, on my radar warning receiver, or, you know, things like that that are, are telling me that someone's looking at me. So this kind of gets into what you and I have been talking about before about, you know, in UPT, you're learning how to fly the aircraft, just the basic administrative process of being able to move an aircraft from point A to point B. And starting in IFF and beyond, there's a, a, a light switch change that occurs, and that is now you're learning how to use an airplane as a weapon. And, you know, the less mental processing power that you can put on the stick and rudder component of flying, the more mental horsepower and attention you can put on Operating your weapon systems, executing your tactics, simply looking outside and checking six, things like that. That's the number one important transition that needs to be made, skill that needs to be built. So um, certainly a, a huge amount of effort and attention is made to build those skills. And there, you know from your general aviation flying, that's not a natural thing. You know, we as humans sort of live in this like, letterbox type world where we look you know a couple of degrees above where our eye line is and a couple of degrees below where our eye line is and if you apply that to the you know the inherently three-dimensional world of flying and the especially three-dimensional world of air combat um it's extremely limited you know it leaves this whole hemisphere of things above you and below you that uh you can have people come in to bite you um so it is a learned skill to get out of this, you know, just I'm going to look at the horizon and I'm going to look in one particular area. You know, if you are, I know on your shelf you've got the, the Strike Eagle, you know, 3-3, which is, you know, the basic uh, um, flying manual, if you will. And it, you know, cuts the world into into pieces, you know, and it, it gives you a specific area. If you don't have a natural scan, it forces you to, look here, then look there, then look here, then look there in a particular order, 
gives you sort of a crutch to build a natural habit pattern. And, you know, because it's such a, a core component of what being a fighter pilot or a Wizzo, whatever, if you're in a two seater, uh, because it's a core piece of your skill, it eventually becomes habitual, but it is a learned uh, trait. So, okay. So, so that's, that's kind of interesting then. That's how, that's how things work in terms of the visual scan. I was just kind of thinking, okay, you know, 420 knots is about five miles a minute. You know, if you're going 180 degrees from your, from your flight lead, you know, that now you're looking at 10 miles a minute. So, so that's a lot of distance and a lot of, in a, in a very short period of time. And, Okay, and aircraft are small, and you know they happen to be painted in a way that makes them hard to see. You know yeah. because that's kind of the whole point of camouflage. Yeah, so it, so it's a skill. Is, is the, so, and is there some kind of um, intuition that you acquire? Then is there something that happens over time that means that you, as a guy who who finished flying Strike Eagles with uh, after six years of flying them, was much better at being able to just find your flight lead or your wingman after a, some kind of swirling engagement than you were as somebody who attended IFF with 100 hours of T-38. Certainly, and, and it, it's it's all experience. You know, I already kind of mentioned earlier that, uh, or maybe it was on one of those things that we cut out, um, situational awareness, again, can't be taught. It can only be graded. Um, it takes experience to have judgment. And so um, you, my ability as a 1,000-hour fighter pilot compared to my ability as a hundred hour fighter pilot was, you know, obviously an order of magnitude better because you positionally understand that if it is, if it is after a, a multi-aircraft visual engagement, y you have some idea of where the engagement has been and, and your, a, a, another core skill is having the situational awareness to sort of have a 3D mental picture of where the bandits are and where your wingmen are while this dynamic thing is occurring. Um, it takes experience to, to see those things firsthand and um, be able to apply kind of those lessons learned. There are, you know, you know barring some major changes in aircraft capabilities, which again, I'm kind of smiling here because with the fifth gen airplanes, there are some major changes in maneuvering capabilities, but you know, m most turning dog fights are generally some sort of a level type of fight that generally moves downhill because of energy states and things like that, at least in the big strike pig, that's the case. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, again, a after some level of exposure to that, you, 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 kind of have some sort of general idea where aircraft are going to be at any given time. That being said, fratricide happens, miss ID happens, all, all, you know, it, it is a dynamic thing, it is a confusing type of thing, and you do have to work in all of the information that's coming to you from all of these various different sensors on board the aircraft, uh, in addition to listening over the radio and having um, cognizant calm either both, you know, leaving the airplane, explaining what I'm doing, uh, and the other aircraft explaining what they're doing, and, and us having good teamwork. And, and, you know, if you understand the tactics, you have some idea where the other aircraft are going to be. So it's, it's a multitude of uh, things that really have to be going through your mind simultaneously. Uh, that's the skill, obviously, of being a fighter pilot to begin with, that are, are going to build that situational awareness of a battle space and the location of different, you know, players in it.